Hello everybody and welcome to another Python tutorial where I'll be showing you how to build the game of 2048 in Python. Now this game was one of my favorite games as a kid and it's actually very interesting to code out. I won't lie to you, it is a little bit complex, but I think that's what will actually make a great video. I'll teach you some more advanced Python techniques and how you can actually structure a game like this. So we'll go through all of the steps, coding out the grid, combining the tiles, etc. And by the end of this video, you'll have a fully finished game and you will have learned quite a few Python features. Last thing to mention, this video is not designed for complete beginners. You should have some knowledge of Python already, but don't worry if you don't know Pygame, which is the graphics library we'll be using here. Anyways, with that said, let's dive into the video and learn how to build 2048 in Python. All right, so let's begin here by just walking through at a high level exactly what it is that we need to do and kind of come up with a bit of a plan before we just jump in to the tutorial. So as you can see here, we have a grid, right? We actually have a four by four grid. So we have at most 16 tiles that can be inside of the grid. Now these tiles can either be twos or fours. We always start out with two twos on the screen. And then anytime we make a move, we will add one tile to the screen that will randomly be a two or a four. When the tiles have the same values and they hit each other, so in this case, if I go down, they'll merge. So you can see that we had those fours turn into eights. Pretty simple in terms of the rules here, and eventually you will lose the game if there's no more room on the screen to add more tiles and you can't merge any of them together. Now this might seem like a simple game, but it's actually a bit complicated because of the movement of these tiles and making it look smooth and animated. So what we'll begin by doing is setting up the general grid, we'll draw all of the lines, we'll pick the different colors, we'll start being able to generate some different tiles, and then where it will get a little bit more difficult is when we need to move and merge the tiles together. So for now, let's start by setting up the screen. We want to work on actually creating this grid system that you see here and then having some representation for our different tiles. So we'll pick the different tile colors, etc. kind of get the drawing and hook up some of the different functions. Once we've done that, then we'll actually go over to the whiteboard and I'll explain to you exactly how we do the movement of the tiles and some of the more complex logic, which I think is really interesting and you guys will get some value from. So let's hop in to our code editor here. I am using Visual Studio Code. Feel free to use whatever you would like. Now the first thing we need to do here is install the Pygame module, which is what we're gonna be using for all of our graphics. So we're gonna go into our terminal, and in this case I'm on Mac, so I'm gonna type pip3 install Pygame. Obviously this assumes you already have Python installed. Now that should install the Pygame library. I already have it installed, so I'm not gonna run this command. If you're on Windows, you can try pip install Pygame. If you're on Linux, it'll be pip3 install Pygame. And if none of those work, you can try python hyphen m pip install Pygame or python3 hyphen m pip install Pygame. I also have two videos that I'll leave on the screen that will show you how to fix this pip import. So for some reason it says pip is not a valid command, follow those videos and they should show you how to install Pygame. Okay, now that we have Pygame installed, we just wanna test this. So I've opened up a new file here in VS Code and we're gonna start by just importing Pygame. So we'll import Pygame and then we'll simply run our file and we'll just make sure that we don't get any errors. Here it says hello from the Pygame community, which tells me that we are good to go. Okay, so now that we've imported Pygame, we'll import a few other modules that we're gonna to need to use. So we're gonna say import random, and import math because we're gonna need those. And then we are going to say pygame.init. This will just initialize all of the different features that we need. Now that we have this, what I like to begin by doing is defining some different constants on my screen. Let me just make this a little bit bigger so we can read it easier. And these constants are values that are not gonna change but that we'll need throughout the rest of the program. So we'll begin by writing those variables and we do these in capitals to represent that they're constant. So first we're gonna set the FPS. Now the FPS is the frames per second, and this will allow us to dictate how quickly the game is running and to regulate the speed on different devices. So we're gonna type FPS equals 60. We then need to specify the width and the height. So I'm gonna say width comma height equals 800, 800, because I just want this to be a square. We then are gonna determine the row size. So we're gonna say rows is equal to four and columns are equal to four. And what's nice about this approach here is later on we can very easily change the width and the height and we can adjust the number of rows and columns we want if we wanna make the game more complex or a little bit different. Now, the next thing we need to do is determine how large a tile is going to be or one of the rectangles is gonna be that's inside of our grid. So the way we do that is we'll say the 
with all capitals, rectangular height is equal to the height of our screen divided by the number of rows that we have, right? In this case, we have a height of 800, four rows, meaning each tile will be 200 pixels tall. We're then gonna say our rectangular width is equal to the width integer divided by the columns. The reason we're doing integer division is so that we get an integer rather than a floating point value. Now there's a few colors that we're gonna define that we'll need for right now. So we're gonna say our outline color is gonna be equal to kind of a nice gray. Now I've already found these RGB colors, so I'll just type them out and you can copy them with me. So this is 187, 173, 160. Whenever you're defining colors in Pygame, you have the option to use RGB, which stands for red, green, blue. First value is the amount of red, second is the amount of green, last is the amount of blue. These values can be in the range of zero to 255. If we had zero, 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 that would be black. If we had 255, 255, 255, that would be white. Next, we're gonna say, in all capitals again, the outline thickness is equal to, and then this will be 10. We can adjust this later. This is how thick the lines will be on the screen. And then we're gonna have the background color, and this will be equal to a different shade of gray, which will be 205, 192, 180. Don't worry too much about the colors. Again, I already just found these. Next, we're gonna say a font color. This will be the color of the text on the tiles. I'm gonna go 119, 110 and 101 for kind of a blackish grayish shade there. Okay, so now that we've defined some of our constants, we're gonna create a Pygame window. So whenever we're coding in Pygame, we have a window. The window is where we can draw objects and is really representing the canvas of our screen. So we're gonna say in all capitals, if I could toggle the caps locks button, which for some reason is not working. Okay, window is equal to Pygame dot display dot set underscore mode. And inside of here, we're gonna pass a tuple that contains the width and the height, okay? So this will actually create a Pygame window for us. So again, Pygame dot display dot set underscore mode, then pass a tuple, make sure you don't forget the enclosing parentheses there. And by the way, all of this code will be available from the link in the description in case you are getting confused or you wanna copy a specific area. Next, we're gonna say pygame dot display dot set underscore caption. This will be the title of the window. And I'm just gonna call this 2048, which is the name of the game. Okay, last, we have two more constants that we need. We're gonna have a font. Now a font is something that we can use to render text onto the screen. So we're gonna say font is equal to pygame dot font dot with a capital S Y S font like that. Then we can put the name of the font. I always use Comic Sans. We're gonna put the size of the font, which we'll go with as 60 for now. And then we'll say bold equals true because we want the bold version of the font. Lastly, we're gonna define a variable here we'll use later called move velocity. This is the speed at which the tiles will move and I'm gonna go with 20 pixels per second. Okay, so that is most of the constants that we need. We define our FPS, width, height, rows, calls, rectangular height and width, and then the different colors we need, as well as set up the Pygame window. Just to make this a bit cleaner, I'll move this down here so it's the last line. We have our font and we have our move velocity, and now we are ready to start coding out some more components of our game. So the first thing we usually do when we're working with Pygame is we create something known as the main loop. Now the main loop is an event loop that's gonna run constantly and check for things like button presses, exiting the screen. It's essentially what will just run the game, okay? It's the main loop that's handling all of the different events. So we usually put that inside of a function. So we'll simply say define main. And then what we need to do is obviously call this function. So we're gonna go down to the bottom of the screen and we're gonna say if underscore underscore name is equal to underscore underscore main underscore underscore, then call main. And what we're gonna do is actually call this with the window object and we're gonna take in window as a parameter here inside of the main function. So we're just specifying, okay, where do we wanna run the game? Well, we wanna run it on the window that we just defined as a variable here. And if you're wondering what this does, this simply means we are only gonna execute this function if we are running this file directly. I'm not sure if that makes a ton of sense, but essentially if another file were to import this file, this would not run. Whereas if we actually run this file directly, which is what we'll be doing, then this will be true and we'll run this window. That's all this name equals main does. Just protects you in case you're reusing some functions in here and you don't wanna actually run what's known as the main line. Okay, so there we go, we have main. Now inside of main, we need to create a loop that's gonna to continue to run. So the first thing we're gonna do is set up a clock object. This will allow us to regulate the speed of the loop. So we're gonna say pygame.time 
with a capital dot clock. We're then going to have a variable called run equals true, which will set to false when we want to exit the loop. We'll then say while well, run and we'll say clock dot tick. And then we're going to tick based on the frames per second, which is this. Now, this tick will just make it so this while loop is only going to run at most one time every 60 seconds. It could run less than that. But the reason we put this here is so that people that are running on different speed of computers don't have the game running at a different speed. If you didn't have this clock here, what will happen is you'll simply run the loop at whatever the fastest speed is you can run it at, which means someone on a really powerful computer is going to see the game a lot faster than someone on a slow computer. So always go Good idea to have this clock. Now that we have the clock, what we're going to do is create a simple event loop that's just going to listen for all of the different key presses and events that could occur. So to do that, we're going to say for event in pygame dot event dot get. This will loop through all of the events that have occurred, and we can then check the event and handle it. So we're going to say if the event dot type is equal to pygame dot with all capitals quit, then we will say run in lower cases is equal to false and we'll break out of this loop now what that's going to do is simply say okay if we press the exit button that's what this quit event is we're going to set run equal to false so this loop will stop running we're going to break immediately out of this event loop so we don't handle it and then what will happen is we'll come outside of the loop and we'll run the command pygame.quit which will simply quit the pygame window for us so that is now the main loop. And what should happen is if we run this code, we should actually see a window appearing. And if we press the X button, we should be able to cleanly exit. So let's go ahead and try that. And you can see we get 2048. We get the window of our size 800, 800. And I can click exit and I cleanly exit the code. All right, so now that we have that, let's move on to doing some drawing operations so that we can actually see some stuff appearing on the screen. Now, I typically like to separate the drawing from the event handling just so it's a little bit cleaner. So the way I'll do that is I'll define a function here called draw. You'll notice that in my code, I'll write a lot of functions just to make sure everything is clean, readable, and easy to debug. And we can quickly figure out where something's going wrong by just isolating it to a specific function. This is good practice and something you can kind of take note of while I'm coding. So in the draw function, I'm going to take a window. And what I'll do for now is simply set the background color and then update the screen. So I'm going to say window dot fill. And this allows you to fill the window completely with a background color. So we're going to say window dot fill and then background color. If we look at background color here, this is what it is. So we're essentially just kind of painting the entire window this color. Then what we can do is say pygame dot display dot update. Now, the way that Pygame works is we do all of these drawing or paint events, and then as soon as an update is called, we'll actually apply all of those onto the screen in the order in which we wrote them. So what that means is that we're always going to fill the screen first, because what that will typically do is it will actually override whatever was on the screen by for, before, sorry, by painting over top of it. Then we'll do any other operations to draw the updated screen, and then we'll update. And then when we do the update, we'll actually see that being performed on the screen. I know it's a little bit abstract right now, but it's just like we do all of these paint operations, then we update, then they're all applied at once rather than happening one at a time. So now we just need to call that function. So inside of this loop, make sure you're inside of the while loop here. At the bottom, we're going to say draw and we're going to pass that window object. And now we should be getting the background color on our screen. So let's try this out. And you can see that now it fills with the background color. OK, great. So now that we've done that, we want to start drawing the grid. So to draw the grid, we're going to write a different function. And we're just going to say draw underscore grid like that. OK, and inside of here, we'll take the window object again. OK, so for drawing the grid, what we'll need to do is we'll need to draw horizontal and vertical lines to represent the separation between tiles. And then we want to draw kind of a border around the entire screen so that we get that nice border effect. So let's begin with the border. To draw the border, we can simply draw a rectangle that's positioned at the edge of the screen. So to draw a rectangle, we'll say pygame.draw.rectangle like that with R-E-C-T. For this, we need to pass where we want to draw it. So we want to draw it on the window. We need to pass the color we'd like to draw it. You can see I'm getting the autocomplete here. So we want the outline color. And then we need to pass a rectangle that represents where we should draw the rectangle. So the way that we pass a rectangle is we give the x coordinate, y coordinate, and then the width and the height of the rectangle. Now, the x and the y represent the top left hand corner where we want to start drawing the rectangle from. 
Now this will get into the Pygam coordinate system, which I'll discuss in a second, but let's go zero, zero, and then width and height. Now, as well as that, we have the option to either have the rectangle be filled completely in or to be an outline. So in our case, we want it to just be an outline. We don't want it to fill in entirely. We don't want to draw a solid, rec solid rectangle, sorry. We want one that's hollow. So what we'll do is pass what's known as the width or the thickness. So I'm going to say width, and then this is going to be the outline thickness, which in our case, I believe is 10 pixels. So before we go any further, let's draw this on the screen just so that we can see what it looks like. So let's go here. And in our draw, after we draw the background, we're going to say draw grid, and we're going to pass the window. So let's run this now. And you should see that we're getting kind of this outline. It's a little bit faint on my screen, but I think you can probably see it. Maybe not with OBS recording, but I can see it at least here. And we do have an outline filling the screen. Okay, so that's how that works. Now, actually, let's run this again. One thing to note here, when we're talking about coordinates and XY values in Pygame, we always start at 0, 0, which is the top left-hand corner of the screen. So rather than starting at the middle, which is typically 0, 0, it's the top left, meaning as you go to the right, your X value increases, and as you go down, your Y value increases. So if we look at the bottom right-hand corner, that would be 800, 800 in terms of the coordinate grid in Pygame. So just keep that in mind. Um, you'll, you'll see as we go through here how we kind of do the positioning. Okay, so we've drawn that. Now we actually want to draw the outlines. Uh, sorry, so like the grid lines, right? So we can start by drawing the horizontal lines. So we can say for row in range and then in all capitals rows. So we're going to draw a line for every single row that we have. And what we need to do here is simply calculate the Y coordinate of the row or of the line, sorry, that we want to draw. So we're going to say Y is equal to row multiplied by the rectangular height. Now the way this will work is we'll start with row being equal to zero and then it will become one, two, three, and then it will not be equal to whatever the last row is, which is fine. And in fact, we can actually do one comma rows because we don't need to draw the very top line because that will already have been drawn by the rectangular outline that we drew. Anyways, what we're gonna do here is draw a line. The line will go from the X coordinate zero to the width of the screen. And then what we'll do is adjust the Y coordinates that we're moving the line down every time the loop happens. So we take whatever the height of one tile is and we multiply that by the current row and that tells us the Y coordinate for this line. So we're gonna say pygame.draw.line. Similarly to here to the rectangle, we're gonna pass a window. We're gonna pass the outline color and then we're gonna pass zero and then y, y is our dynamic value. And when we draw a line, we pass the starting position and the ending position. So the two points essentially for the line to be drawn between. So next we're gonna say width and then y. So we're constantly always gonna have the line starting at zero x and width x. So that way we're filling the entire screen horizontally and we're just adjusting the y coordinate. So vertically where that line's gonna be drawn. Now again, we need to specify the thickness. We're gonna put the outline thickness here, also known as the width of that line. So now if we actually go here and refresh, you'll see that we get our vertical lines appearing, or sorry, horizontal lines. So now we can copy this exact same thing and paste it here and just adjust it for the vertical lines. So we're gonna say for column in range one comma calls. Now this is gonna be column times the rectangular width and we're going to change this to be x so now we're going to keep the y values constant and adjust the x so it's going to become x and then zero and this is going to become x and height so you can see that we always have two fixed values right where we want to draw between and then what we're adjusting is the x position whereas here we were adjusting the y position and where we make that change is with call and the rectangular width versus row and the rectangular height. Now in this case, the rectangular height and width are the same. Uh, however, they could be different, which is why I'm doing this in two loops, because if we wanted to have actual rectangles, not squares, then this code would adjust to that uh, appropriately. Okay, so let's run this. And you'll see here that now we get our grid. Okay, so now that we have our four by four grid, what we want to start doing is actually representing tiles in those grids and then drawing the tiles on the screen. Once we're able to draw the tiles on the screen, then we can start moving them on the screen. Again, uh, as I said, it's a bit more complicated. So we're gonna create a class here called tile. 
Now I want to use a class just because there's some methods related to each tile which will fit nicely inside of this object or inside of the class. Um, so it just makes it a little bit cleaner. So as a class variable, I'm going to specify colors. Now what I'm going to do is paste a bunch of colors in here. I don't want to write all of them out because it's a little bit tedious. And these are the exact same colors that are used in the real 2048 game. Now these colors represent from like 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, etc. So as we go up, it's just multiples of 2 or whatever double the last value is, okay? So that's kind of how I'm doing it. I'll show you how we index the colors in a second. And if you want this list of colors, obviously you can pause it and type it out. Or you can just view the code that's linked in the description. And rather than looking at everything, you can just copy this colors variable, okay? So again, in the description, you can find all of the code. There should be a GitHub link and just go ahead and find the colors and paste them into your code if you're following along with me step by step. So next we're going to define the initialization for our tiles. So we're going to say define underscore underscore init underscore underscore. We're going to say self value row and column. Now for each tile, we need to know what the value of the tile is. So is it a two? Is it a four? Is it an eight, etc. We also need to know its positioning in the grid. So what row is it at? What column is it at? And that will allow us to determine the X and Y position of where we want to draw the tile. It also allows us to know what tiles we can merge with. So that's why we're storing that value. So we're going to say self dot value equals value and create that attribute. And we're going to say self dot row is equal to row self dot column is equal to column. And then at the same time, we're actually going to set what the X and Y coordinates are for drawing this specific tile. So we're going to say a column times the rectangular width and self dot Y is equal to the row multiplied by the rectangular height. Now, how does this work? Well, if we were in row zero, column zero, then we would simply start drawing this tile at the position zero, zero, right? That's the very top left hand corner of the screen. If we were in row zero, column one, then we would want to start drawing this from if I can calculate this correctly, a Y value of zero, but an X value of 200, because that's where we want to draw the tile that's in that first column. When I say first column, I really mean the second column. It's because in programming, we're starting indexing or starting counting at zero. You'll see what I mean. And actually, I can just run this to explain it to you. Like if we want to draw a tile that's where my mouse is here, I hope you can see it in the position one, one. So one, one is you know, row one, column one, as opposed to zero, zero here. Then what we're going to do is start drawing it at the top left hand corner position of this, which is what we're calculating when we're doing the X and Y. So we multiply the column by the rectangular width, which brings us over here. We multiply the row by the rectangular height, which brings us here. And then we would draw the rectangle in this square. You'll see what I mean as we go through the code, but hopefully that's an okay explanation. Okay. So now that we have the initialization and we have some values that we need, we want to start writing some other methods related to this object. So before I write all of them, we'll specify what they are. So we're going to say, well, we want to be able to get the color that we're going to draw this tile in, and that's going to be based on its value. We also want to be able to draw this. So we're going to say self and window because that's what we need to draw. And what else do we need to do? Well, we need to be able to move this. So we're going to take in self and some delta, which is how much we would want to move this by. And I don't know what just happened there on the screen. And then lastly, we'll have another method called set position, which will allow us to actually determine, let me just pass this here, what position this uh, tile is currently in while we're moving the tile. We'll use some of these methods later on, but I just like to stub them out so we know what we're about to write. So let's begin by writing the get color and the draw methods, which are the ones we'll use for now. So again, we need to be able to determine what color out of this list of colors we're going to use for the tile. And that's going to be based on what the value of the tile is. So we need to have some kind of function that can essentially give us the following values. So when we have a value of two. We want to get the zeroth index, which is the first color, which is what the color of the value two should be. When we have the value of four, we want to get index one. When we have the value of eight, we want to get index two. And when we have the value of 16, we want to get index three. So you can follow this pattern here and you can actually come up with an equation which will allow you to get this specific mapping of value. So anytime the value of X or the input doubles, we want to then get the next value uh, in our sequence. Hopefully that makes a bit of sense. I'm sure this is bringing you back to math class. 
Well, how do we do that? Well, we have this wonderful thing called a logarithm, which will actually allow us to figure out what the power is that's required passed on some value to get some other value, right? I'm sure you guys are familiar with logarithms. I'm not going to explain how the logarithm works, and that was pretty poor explanation. But we're going to say the color index is equal to the math of log base 2 of our current value. Now, if we look at the logarithm function, we can see that if we pass f of 2, that actually gives us 1. However, we want this instead to be 0. So what we'll need to do is simply subtract 1 from whatever the value of the logarithm was that's returned. Now, just to ensure we're always getting an integer value and not a floating point value, we'll first convert the result of the logarithm to an integer. It will always be a whole number anyways, but this will just strip off any decimal point that might be there and then we'll subtract one. So now we have a function that takes in whatever our values are and maps it to the correct index in our colors list. So now that we have the index, we wanna access the color. So we'll say color equals self.colors at the color index, okay? And then we will return the color like that. So this now will give us the correct color based on the value of this tile. Okay, now we want to draw the tile on the screen. Now when we're drawing the tile on the screen, what we need to do is draw a rectangle for that tile. We also need to then draw on top of the rectangle the value of the tile. So what we'll begin by doing is drawing the rectangle and then we will draw the text on top of it. So we're gonna say that the color we want is equal to self.getColor and this is gonna tell us the color that the rectangle should be. We're then gonna draw the rectangle. So we're gonna say pygame.draw dot rectangle and we're going to draw it on the window what color do we want to draw it well the color that we just got and then we want to draw this at the self dot x position the self dot y position and with the rectangular width and the rectangular height and that's it we want this to actually be a solid rectangle so this time we won't provide a width which means it will fill in the entire rect that we provided here now that we've done that, we want to generate some text that we're going to draw in the middle of the rectangle. So to do that, we're going to use our font object. So we're going to say text is equal to font dot render. So the process whenever you want to draw text is you use this font object and you render some string into a surface is what it's called that you can then put onto the screen. So we're going to say font dot render. And what we pass for this is the value. So we're going to put an F string here. Or actually, we can just do string of self.value. So we convert our numeric value into a string so that we can actually draw that. We're going to pass one for something known as anti-aliasing. Don't worry too much about that. And then we need to specify the color. Now, the color is going to be the font color that we specified earlier. Now that we have the text object, what this has actually done is created a surface that contains the text. And now we need to specify where on the screen we want to put the text. So to do that, we say window.blit. Blit is how you put a surface onto the screen. So it's a bit different than drawing the rectangles. Now what we pass is what surface we want to put on the screen. In this case, I want to put the text surface. And now we need to place this in the middle of the rectangle. Now to place this in the middle of the rectangle, we need to determine the top left hand corner position of where we should start drawing the, um, what do you call this here, the text. So in order to do this, there's a little bit of math that we need to perform. I don't know if I have a drawing tablet or maybe an ink thing that I can use here on Mac. Let's see if there's like a drawing surface or something. Okay, I just found like an online drawing program that we'll quickly have a look at here just so that you can kind of see what I mean. So let's say we have our rectangle, right? Kind of a sketchy rectangle. Now we want to draw our number in the middle of the rectangle. What we need to do is figure out the location that we want to draw it in. Now, naively, you might think, okay, well, if I want to figure out the X, Y position, let me just figure out whatever the X, Y position is of this. And then we'll just take whatever the width of the rectangle is and we'll start drawing it directly in the middle, right? So you'll just take, okay, we have W and we'll just take W over two and that's where we'll start drawing it. The issue is if we do that, then we're gonna start drawing here and the number is gonna go to the right because it's the top left hand corner that we're drawing from. So what we actually need to do is offset this by the by half the width of the object that we're drawing. So what I mean by that is we wanna draw like this, right? So let's say the number is kind of in this box, like in this bounding box, we wanna find this location. That's where we wanna start drawing the number from. 
So the way we actually do that is, let me just clean this up a little bit. I know it's very messy here. We have some w, right? This is the width of the rectangle. So we start by taking w over 2, which is going to give us this position. So w over 2. We then want to make sure that the number is perfectly centered. So we say, OK, well, we have the bounding box of the number. And this has some width as well. We can just call this, uh, I don't know, a. OK, so what we actually do now is we take a over 2 and we subtract that from w over 2 and that gives us this position here which is the top left hand corner position of where we want to start drawing this object from so quick clarification right we go to the middle of the screen we then subtract from half the width of the object we're going to be drawing and that means when we draw the object out it will be perfectly centered in the middle of the screen the same thing applies in the y direction so that's exactly what we're going to do here now i know that was really sketchy but hopefully that's an okay explanation all right so now that we have that, let's start doing our little bit of calculations here. So we're going to say, OK, well, we'll start drawing this at the self dot X position of this current rectangle. And then we're going to add to that what we just specified. So we're going to take whatever the rectangular width is, OK, because that's the width of the rectangle that we're drawing inside of. And we're going to divide that by two. That gives us the middle of the rectangle. But now we need that top left hand corner position. So we're going to say text dot get underscore width. This gives us the width of the text object. And then we're going to divide that by two. This now specifies that this is the X position that we want to draw. Now, next, we're going to do the Y position. So we're going to say self dot Y plus, and this is going to be the rectangular height. If we can get our cap locks to work, For some reason, my caps lock button doesn't want to work very well. So this is going to be the rectangular height over two minus the text dot get underscore height over two. OK, and that's all that will actually blit this on to the screen for us. OK, so now we have the ability to draw our tiles. Now, also notice the order in which we did this. We first drew the rectangle and then we drew the text on top of the rectangle. It's important you do it in this order. Otherwise, the text will be hidden because you'll be drawing the rectangle after. So now what we'll do is call that function. So inside of our draw function, we're now going to take in all of our tiles. Now, we don't yet have any of those tiles, but we will create them in a second. And what we'll do is before we draw the grid, we'll draw all of our, our tiles. And that way, the grid lines will go on top of the tiles, and it will separate them and make it uh, pretty easy to see. So we're just going to say for tile in tiles. And then we'll just say tile.draw. And tiles is actually going to be a dictionary, so I'm just going to say tiles.values. I know it seems a bit weird because we haven't yet created the tiles, but we'll just do a quick test, and I'll show you kind of how it works. All right, so now we have that for drawing. Now we just need to make some tiles and then pass those to our draw function. So we're going to say tiles is equal to a dictionary. The reason we're going to use a dictionary is that we want to be able to index or locate all of the tiles very quickly by their row and their column. So there's multiple ways that we can go about indexing our tiles or storing them. But what we want to come up with is a key that kind of represents the tile. And then the value will be that tile class itself that we can index in here. So to do that, we'll simply say the following. For now, we're going to say 00, zero which is representing the row and the column. So like you could have 0 hyphen 0. But in our case, we know we're always going to have, uh, what do you call it, less than 10 or one digit rows and columns. So we just go with zero, 00. So we'll say 00, zero colon. And then we'll create a tile. Now for a tile, we need a value, a row, and a column. So let's go with a value of 4. And then let's go with a 0, 0 for the row and for the column. OK, so now let me just change this to give you another example. Let's say we have the tile 128. Now we want this to be at row 2, column 0. So that would change this to be 2, 0. OK, the way this works again is that we have a two digit string. The first digit represents the row. The second digit represents the column. And then that's associated with the tile object itself that we actually want to be representing and drawing. This way, we can always index a tile given its row and column, and we can find it instantly inside of the tiles dictionary. This is opposed to as if we made a list. If we made a list and we wanted to locate a specific tile, we need to potentially iterate through all of the tiles in the list and check their rows and columns to find the one that we want. Whereas here, we can always have instant access to a tile. So kind of an efficiency thing. That's why we've written it this way. OK, now we're going to pass tiles to the draw function and just make sure they draw correctly on the screen. So let's run this. And we got an error. It says draw is missing one uh, required positional argument window. OK, so we're going to go here to tile.draw. 
and pass window. All right, let's rerun this. And now we should get our tiles on the screen and we get them at the positions we specified, right? So this was what, two zero and zero zero. We can do one more tile just as a test. So let's go here and we'll say maybe zero two. And this will be with a tile. And this will be, let's go 64 and then zero two. Okay, let's run. And you see now we get the 64 tile appearing in the correct position. Okay. So that's great. However, we don't want to actually start our tiles with some fixed ones on the screen. We want to randomly generate two tiles that have the value two that will begin as our tiles, right? So let's write a function that can do that. Let's say generate tiles. Now for this, all we're going to do is just randomly pick two positions that we can put the tiles um, in. Okay. And we'll just make sure they're not the same. So we're going to say tiles is equal to an empty dictionary. We're going to say for underscore in range two. If you're unfamiliar with the underscore, this is a placeholder value that we can use when we don't actually care about the variable we put here. Normally you do something like for i in range two, but in my case, I don't actually want to use i, I just want to do something two times. So we'll just say for underscore in range two. We're now going to say row column is equal to, and we're going to call a function which is get random position. And we're going to pass our tiles. And then we're going to say tiles, we're going to do an F string, and this is going to be at row column, if we can do this is equal to a tile. And then this is going to be two row call, we're then going to return our tiles. Okay, let me slow down a little bit to explain what we just did. So we have an empty dictionary where we're going to store our tiles, we're doing something two times, and what we want to do is generate a random row and a random column to place our tiles inside of. Now we want to make sure that we're only doing this for a tile that does not yet exist, right? We don't want to create a tile that's in the place of another tile. So that's where this function will come in, which we'll write in a second, it will make sure when we are randomly picking the row and column, we don't pick one that already exists. Then what we're doing is saying, okay, tiles, well, this is a dictionary, so we need to set the key. The key is going to be equal to first, whatever the row is, and second, whatever the column is. So we use an F string available in Python 3.6 and above, which allows us to embed inside of curly braces here, any values that we want to be converted to a string. So we're saying, okay, well, we just want the row and the column, which are numbers, they're going to convert it to a string, that's going to give us the correct key. And then we're going to make that equal to a tile object, which has the value of two, because we always want to start with twos in the row and the column. Okay, now let's write our get random position. So we're going to say get underscore random underscore pause, this needs to take in the tiles so that we make sure that we are not placing this in a position that already exists. So we're going to start by saying row equals none column equals none, because we don't yet know what we want. And now we're going to say, while true, and we're going to continue to randomly generate rows and columns or a position for this tile, as long as this position already exists. So what I mean by that is as soon as we find a position that does not yet already exist inside of our tiles, then we will use that one. Otherwise, we're just going to keep randomly generating positions. So we're going to say row is equal to random dot random range. And this is going to be in the range zero to rows. When we use rand range, it means we'll generate up to but not including whatever the value is here, which is four. So we'll generate a random value between zero and three inclusively. We're then going to say column is equal to random dot rand range, and then zero columns. Okay, so we're just picking what the random position is for what it should be what we're going to attempt. And then we're going to say if and same thing, we're going to do an F string here, row column is not in. And then we can just say tiles like that, then we're going to break. Now, this is another advantage of using the dictionary, we can instantly check whether or not this key exists inside of the dictionary, because of that property of the dictionary, we have instant access to see, okay, does this key so does this position row column already exist? If it uh, does not sorry, which is what we're checking here, then we're going to break, right? So then if we break, we're going to return the row and the column from the function that we generated. Otherwise, we're going to continue to do this until this condition is true, allowing us to break out meaning we found a random position. Great. Okay, so now that we've done that, we will go over to 
our main and we'll say tiles is equal to generate tiles and that should generate two random tiles on the screen for us. So let's try this now and you see that we get a randomly generated tiles. Let's run it again. We get more randomly generated tiles, etc. Okay. So there you go. We've now generated the tiles and placed them on the screen. Okay. So at this point we've written quite a bit of code and we have the main structure of the application set up. Now what we want to start doing is moving the tiles around. So let me hop over to the drawing tablet and explain to you that process. It is a little bit complicated, then we'll begin implementing it. All right, so I'm on the drawing tablet now and I'm going to explain at a high level what it is that we're about to do. Now I can't cover everything conceptually here, but I'll give you a sense of how to think about this problem. Now if you are someone who likes these problems, feel free to try to solve it on your own uh, first of all, but you will see that it's a little bit complicated because of the fact that we actually want to animate the tiles and we want to move them on the screen. So moving them is actually the difficult part. Doing the merges is not so hard to figure out what the new position should be. It's more about getting to that new position and how we iterate and move so that it looks smooth. Anyways, let's have a look here. So we have a few different edge cases that we need to handle and we can go through them one by one. So let's say we have the number two. This is our tile and we decide to make a movement to the left. Keep in mind, all the movements effectively are gonna be handled the exact same. So we can just look at a case in which we're moving to the left, but the exact same thing would apply if we're moving to the right. There's just a few variables that change. So we're moving to the left and we have this tile. Now there's a few things that can happen. The first thing that can happen is there can be nothing to the left and we can simply shift the tile. That's the easiest case, right? There's nothing to the left of us. So we just move the tile until we hit the border. Pretty straightforward. We take the X position and we just shift it over. And then once it gets inside of this square here, we just change the tiles position. So then rather than being at one, one, it's now at one zero. Okay. So that's the important thing to also keep in mind here. We have an X and a Y, which is the location in which we're drawing the tile. And we also have a row and a call, which will represent with R and C, which tells us the current location of the tile in the grid. So these values are linked together. However, while we are moving the tile, the R and the column is kind of in between, right? For example, at one point in time, my tile might be in between two rows and columns. In that case, we don't know its exact location and we need to wait until it reaches some kind of boundary point to then reset the row and column to be the correct position based on the X and Y value. So I just wanna say that one more time because I understand it's a little bit confusing. We're gonna have a tile that's gonna be moving, could be up, right, whatever. While it's moving, this row and column, we don't necessarily know what the correct value is. So at some point we need to adjust this so that it represents where its location actually is on the screen. And that's typically when the tile is no longer moving. Okay, so anyways, that's kind of the basics there. So this is the first case, we just simply move the dial over to the left. Now the second case, is when we have a blocking tile that is in the direction in which we're moving. So again, we're moving to the left, that's where we've shifted, and now we see that when we move to the left, well, this tile exists and it doesn't allow us to move. So if that's the case, we just simply stay put, right? Well, there's no movement that occurs for either of these tiles. Now it gets a bit more complicated, right, where we have this tile here. So now in this case, we move until we reach a tile that is blocking us, okay? So obviously I think that makes a bit of sense. Now the next instance is when we are moving in a direction and we have a tile that contains the same value as us. If that's the case, we actually wanna take this tile, we wanna move it so it kind of merges with this tile and then we need to update the value of the tile to the left, so this becomes four, and remove this tile, so let's kind of do an X here so that we no longer see it on the screen. So this is the merge instance. Now the thing with this is that there's kind of two stages to this merge. The first stage is while the tile is actually moving into the position of this tile. So to keep things looking smooth, we don't just wanna instantly merge the two tiles as soon as we see that they are gonna merge. What we wanna do instead is we wanna take this tile and we wanna kind of move it inside of the other tile and then as soon as it's fully in, uh, emerged in that tile is when we remove it from the screen and then we simply update this one so it now becomes the new tile value. So those are those two situations, right? The first situation, okay, we know we're gonna merge, we need to keep moving it so it looks smooth. Then the second situation is, okay, we've already moved it inside of the other tile, so now we'll merge it together. 
So those are pretty much all of the edge cases. Again, we have a situation in which there's no tile to our left or in the direction in which we're moving, we just move the tile. We have a situation where there's a blocking tile where there's no movement that occurs. And we have a situation in which there's a merging tile where there's two phases. The first phase is to move into the square where the merging tile is, and then to merge the two tiles and remove the other tile. So that's what we need to handle. However, doing this is a little bit easier said than done because of all the things that can happen. For example, let's say we have something that looks like this, right? We have like two, 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 two. Well, what we need to do is actually make sure that we move the tiles in the correct order such that the merges happen appropriately. So in this situation where we have four twos, we want to ensure that we don't accidentally merge the two middle tiles because if we were to do that, we would be left with a result of two, four, two, which is incorrect. What we want instead, although I guess you could define this behavior however you want, is that after we do this movement, we end up with two fours, right? So we delete, delete, and we have four, four. So what that means is that we need to make sure that we're gonna start moving the tiles from the direction in which we're moving. So if I'm moving left, we're gonna check the first tile, then the second tile, then the third tile, then the fourth tile, and at one step at a time, move them to the left rather than moving the tiles from the right first. Because if we move the ones on the right, then we're gonna merge in the wrong order. So the merging order is important. There's a lot of other factors we need to consider there, but I think that's enough in terms of the high level explanation. So let us now get into the code and I'll start explaining it. And again, feel free to pause it, go reference some of the other code if anything's going wrong and ask any questions you have in the comments down below. All right, so we're back now and we're gonna start handling the movement. So what we'll do is we'll define a function move tiles, which is going to allow us to move them. So we're gonna say window tiles clock and direction, and this will be one function that will actually handle the movement of the tiles in all of the directions. Now we'll start by just doing one direction so you get the gist of it, and then we'll handle the other directions which are just slight variants of one of them, right? So what we're gonna do is create a variable called updated equals true, and we're gonna create something called blocks, which I'll define in a second. Pretty much this blocks set is gonna tell us which tiles have already merged in a movement because we don't wanna be merging multiple sets of tiles. I can show you an example of what I mean in a second when we actually run the code, but we create this set here so that we know which tiles already had a merge operation occur, so we don't allow them to merge again, which means we don't get this like huge chain of tiles merging in a row, which is not how the original game behaves. You can obviously change the behavior if you want, but that's not what I wanna do here. Okay, so now what we wanna do is just handle what direction it is that we're moving. So we'll just stub a little if statement here and we'll say if direction is equal to left, we'll say elif the direction is equal to right. And let's just do a pass here. We'll say elif the direction is equal to up. And we'll say elif after we pass, just so that we have a stub there, the direction is equal to down. Okay, so now we're handling all of the directions. The first direction we'll go into is left. So what we need to do is define a few functions and variables that we'll use in the main kind of block of our code. So this is gonna seem very abstract right now when I write this out, but just bear with me and I promise you it will start to make more sense. So we're gonna say our sort function and we're gonna use something called a lambda if I could type this. So we're gonna say lambda x and then x dot column. Now remember that we wanna move the tiles when we're going left, for example, from left to right. So the first tile we move is the one that's furthest on the left and then we go to the right and then move the tiles in that order. That way we merge in the correct order. So we need to start actually moving from that left side. So that means that we need to actually sort the tiles so that we know which tile we should move first because right now our tiles are stored in a dictionary and we're not gonna necessarily have them in a sorted order. So we're gonna take the tiles and we're gonna sort them into a list and then we're gonna move all of the tiles. So that's why I'm setting the key here equal to the column. So I'm saying, okay, we're moving to the left, which means we're gonna sort the tiles by their column. Now, if you're unfamiliar with this lambda, this is a one line anonymous function and it works the exact same as any other function. So this that I just wrote right here is the exact same code as this. Uh, oops, not func define func x and then return x.com. 
Okay, it's the exact same thing. It's just so you can write it in one line and you don't need to define a name for it when you don't need that name. Okay, so that's kind of all that does. This is like, okay, we're making a function, this is our parameter, and this is what we want to return from the function. It only allows us one line, but that's fine, that's all we need. Okay, then we're gonna have reverse equals, and this is gonna be false. Now this is gonna tell us whether or not we want to sort in ascending or descending order. So we could actually change this to just be ASC like that, standing for ascending. Uh, or no, that's gonna look a little bit weird. We'll do reverse instead, sorry. This is just, again, telling us, okay, do you wanna sort in reverse order or correct order? Because when we're gonna go in the right, we wanna sort again, but we wanna sort in reverse order, so we start with the largest column elements, which are on the furthest to the right. Okay, next we're gonna have a delta. Now the delta is gonna specify how much we wanna move each tile by each frame in this movement function. So the delta is gonna be negative move velocity, and then zero. So we're specifying how much in the x direction and how much in the y direction we're gonna move. In this case, I wanna move negative in the x direction, which will move us to the left, okay? So reducing x moves to the left. Next, we're gonna have a boundary check. Now this is gonna be a function again, and this is gonna be lambda. We're gonna take in a tile, and we're gonna check if the tile.column is equal to zero. Now, if the column of the tile is equal to zero, that means it's already as far left as it can possibly go. So we're not gonna move it any further to the left because it's hit the bounds of the screen. So again, same thing, anonymous function just tells us, okay, have we hit the boundary or not? Next thing we need is a function that can get us the next tile. So this is the tile to the left of the current tile. We need to check that tile because based on its value, we're either gonna be blocked by it or we are going to merge into it. So we're gonna say get next tile is equal to a lambda function. And this is gonna take in a tile and it's gonna say tiles dot get. And we're gonna say F and then row and then column minus one. So what we're looking for, and sorry, this needs to be the tile dot row and the tile dot column. So what we're looking for is the tile to our left. The tile to our left is the tile that has a column that's one less than us. Now we do dot get because we don't know if this tile exists, so we don't know if there's actually one to our left or not. If there is one, this will return that tile for us, which allows us to use this indexing scheme. Otherwise, it just returns none, okay? Next, we're gonna have our merge check. Now this is a lambda function again, and we're gonna take in our tile and our next tile. Now what this is essentially telling us is whether or not we should merge the tile based on the current movement of this tile because you'll see what we're doing is moving the x coordinate of our tiles until we reach a certain position in which case we then do the merge. So we're gonna say that the tile.x is greater than the next tile.x and then this is going to be plus the move velocity. So what we're checking is okay, tile that we currently have, so the one that we're moving to the left, we're gonna check if its x position is greater than the next tile's x position plus the velocity that uh, we're about to be subtracting as we move. What this is telling us essentially is, okay, have we moved far enough left that it now looks like we're inside of that other tile? If we have, then we can go ahead and merge. If we haven't, which is actually what this is checking, sorry, then we'll keep moving the tile. You'll see how we use it in a second, but this is checking, okay, are we in the position to merge or not? That's pretty much what it's telling us. Okay, next we're gonna have a move check. Now this is gonna be for when we're moving and there is a tile to the left of us. However, that tile is not the same value as the tile that, um, what do you call it, that we're moving. So this is gonna be lambda tile next tile and this is going to be tile.x is greater than the next tile.x plus this time the rectangular width plus the move velocity okay so why are we doing it like this now so in this instance if we're moving to the left and we have a next tile we want to stop moving as soon as we reach the border of that tile now the border of that tile is on the right side of the tile that's to the left of us. So to get that position, we take the next tile.x, we add the width of that tile, and then we add the velocity which we would be moving if we were to continue the move. Um, 
Again, you'll, you'll see how this works in a second. I know it, it's, it's fairly abstract. Okay, lastly, we're gonna have seal is equal to true. Now this essentially tells us whether or not we should round up or round down when we're determining the location of the tile after a move. I know a lot of code, very abstract, but these are the different things that will be adjusted based on the direction that we're moving. So you can imagine when we're moving to the right, some of these things are gonna change, right? Like the move check, the merge check, the sort function is gonna be a little bit different, the reverse function. Okay, so that's kind of what we're doing here in terms of this. And then we have some general code, which we're about to write, which will perform the move based on these functions. So this is kind of the cleanest way to write this. So what we're gonna do is say while updated. Now the idea is, while we've performed some kind of move update, we need to kind of update the screen and redraw it so it looks like we're moving. As soon as we're in a position where nothing has moved, we're gonna stop this while loop, so when no update has occurred, which is what's gonna be indicated by this variable here, then we'll break out of the loop. So now we're gonna say clock.tick, and then we're gonna tick by FPS, and we're gonna say updated, equals false. So it's our responsibility as we go through this loop to update this variable and make it equal to true if an update operation has occurred. So now what we're going to do is we're going to sort the tiles. So remember I said we need to get the tiles in a sorted order such that we're moving them in the correct um, order so that we get the correct moves. So we're going to say sorted tiles is equal to a sorted function of the tiles dot values. We don't care about the keys, we just want the values and the key is gonna be equal to a sort function, okay, like that, and then reverse is equal to reverse. So the sort function we defined here, reverse we defined here, we're now using these to sort the tiles in the correct order. We're then gonna say for i, comma tile in enumerate, and we're gonna enumerate over the sorted tiles. This simply means get the index of the tile as well as the tile object itself. First thing we're gonna check here is, okay, we wanna be moving these tiles. We're doing this for every tile, right? We're gonna check if the tile is at the boundary. So if the boundary check of tile, then simply continue, because if we're at the boundary, there's no movement that needs to occur for this specific tile, so we can move forward. Next thing we need to do is get the next tile. So we're gonna say the next tile is equal to get next tile, and we pass the current tile. Now that's gonna give us the tile that is in the way of which we want to move. So we're now going to say, okay, well, if we don't have a next tile, so if there's no tile in our way, then we can continue to move because we're not at the boundary and there's no tile next to us. So let's just move our tile. So we're going to say tile.move by our delta. And before I forget, let's go and code out this function. So move is right up here. And the way we move is the following. We say self.x plus equals delta zero and self.y plus equals delta one. And that's it, very straightforward. Again, if we go look at our deltas here, you can see that we just have the components of how much we wanna move. In this case, we're just gonna move backwards in the x direction because if we add zero to the existing value here in y, it doesn't do anything. Okay, so that is move. Now we get into the more complicated cases. So we say, all right, well, if there is a tile beside us, we need to check something. We need to check, first of all, is this tile the same value as us? So we're gonna say elif the tile.value is equal to the next tile.value. If it is, now we go into those two cases. So I don't know what I just did there, where we need to determine, okay, well, if it's the same value, we're either, we're gonna be merging with it, right? So we're either in the process of merging with it or we've just merged, like we've moved the tile enough. So we're gonna say if merge check, and then tile, if we can type this correctly, and next tile, then we're gonna say tile.move, and then delta. So this is checking, okay, are we in the process of merging? If we are, we can continue to move the tile. Now, if we are not, then what we need to do is actually perform the merge operation. So the merge operation looks like this. We're gonna take the next tile, we're gonna get its value, and we're gonna multiply it by two. We're then gonna remove the tile that merged with it, which is the one that we're moving. So we're gonna say sorted tiles dot pop at index i, which is the index of this tile in the sorted tiles list. We're then gonna say blocks dot add, and we're gonna add the tile, and we are going to also add the next tile. Or er, sorry, 
We don't need to add the tile because we just removed it. We're just going to add the next tile. Now, what this is doing here is saying, okay, well, we've already, okay, so what this is doing here is simply saying, all right, well, this tile just got merged with another tile. So we want to make sure it doesn't merge again. So we're just adding it into the blocks so that we can then use that set to ensure we don't do a kind of double merge operation. Now, where we'll actually use that is right here. We're going to say, and tile not in blocks and the next underscore tile not in blocks. When I save that, we'll get the auto formatting. But what we're doing here is making sure, okay, well, if the tile dot value is equal to the next tile dot value, so if it's the same, and that tile and the current tile that we have has not merged with another tile, go ahead and we can perform this operation. Now, if it has merged with another tile, we don't want to do this. We don't want to merge with it. So we're not going to initiate that operation. Okay. Next thing we're going to do is we're going to say elif the move check, and this is going to be tile next tile. Then we're going to say tile.move by the delta. Otherwise, we're going to say continue. All right, so let me just quickly break this down here. What we're doing is we're getting the next tile. If we don't have a next tile, we simply move. Now, if we do have a next tile and that tile value is the same as this value, we're going to go ahead and initiate the merge operation, which we discussed. Now, once we reach this elif, we know, okay, we do have a next tile. The next tile's value is not the same as ours. So what that means is that we should move this tile until we reach the border of that next tile, which is what's checked by this function. So we move until this is false, right? Until it says that you can no longer move, we're going to continue to move. Otherwise, if none of that is true, then we just say continue. And what that means is we're not going to do anything. And when we don't do anything, no update occurred. So now we're going to go down here and we're going to say updated equal true. So unless we were in this case or we were on the boundary, we're going to reach this variable and we're going to say update equals true. And that's going to tell us to initiate another loop here and continue the movement process because something did actually move. As soon as this variable never becomes equal to true, we stop the while loop and we exit. Now there's a few other things that we need to do, but that's a good start to our function. All right, so let's continue here. As I was discussing, while we move these tiles, their row and column are gonna be adjusted based on their X and Y position. So based on where they're actually moving in the grid, because as they move uh, enough, then they're gonna be in a different row and a different column. So we need to actually adjust that. So to adjust that, we're gonna use this, if we can write here, set position function. Now the set position function or method, whatever you'd prefer to call it, is simply going to look at the current X and Y position of this, um, what do you call it, tile, and then adjust it, sorry, adjust the row and call based on that X and Y position. So we're going to say seal is equal to false. And this is a variable that's going to tell us whether or not we should round up or we should round down, which is going to be important based on the direction in which we're moving. So we're going to say if ceiling, so simply if we're rounding up, then we're going to say self dot row is equal to the math dot ceiling, which is always rounds a value up. And then we're going to take the self dot y and we're going to divide that by the rectangular height. So let's say the y position is 600, right? We're going to take six. So let's say the y position is 599. We're going to take 599 divided by the rectangular height, which is 200. That's going to give us like 2.9 something. We're then going to round that up to three, telling us that we are currently still in the third row. Okay, we're now going to say self.column is equal to math.ceiling self.x divided by the rectangular width. And then for the else, so if we're not rounding up, we're going to round down. So we're going to say self.row is equal to math.floor. And then the exact same thing here, right? So this is going to be the y value and then self.column is equal to math.floor self.x divided by the rectangular width. Okay, so that is just going to adjust the row and column as we move. And what we're doing is we're essentially with this determining at what point will we move to the left or to the right that we want to set that row column value. So when I go with ceiling, that means as soon as I move fully past the bounding line or I'm right at it, then I'm going to adjust this as I'm moving to the left. Whereas when I'm moving to the right, it's actually going to be the opposite. Um, 
because of the kind of directions in which we're moving. It's it's difficult to explain this, but you'll be able to see in the code here how we change this based on if we're moving to the left or to the right so that we know what row and column we're actually in to check for the next tile. Okay, so now what we'll do is we'll go over here to updated and either before or after updated doesn't actually matter the order in which we do it. We're just gonna set the tile position. So we're gonna say tile, dot set position and we're going to pass that ceiling value which we defined here so when we're moving to the left ceiling is true when we're moving to the right it's going to be false okay now this is all good however you'll notice that we removed some tiles but we only removed them from the sorted tiles list now this is not actually where all of the tiles are stored it's just where they're temporarily stored while we're in this updated loop so what we actually need to do now is adjust the tiles object itself, which was passed in here, to remove any tiles that were then removed from the sorted tiles um, and to kind of adjust them. So what we're gonna do is, inside of the while loop here, but outside of the for loop, so make sure you have that indentation correct, we're gonna say update tiles, and we're gonna take the window, the tiles, and the sorted tiles. Now all this is gonna do is essentially loop through our tiles, and it's just going to remove any of the sorted tiles that no longer exist from tiles. So we're going to say define update underscore tiles, and we'll take in the window, the tiles, and the sorted tiles like that. And we will go ahead and write that function. So the way we can do this is we can just start by clearing all of the tiles. So we're going to say tiles.clear just removes everything from the dictionary. And we'll, then we'll just say for tile in the sorted tiles. And then we're going to say tiles and we'll create an F string again. Okay. And this is going to be tile dot row tile dot column is equal to the tile. That's it. And then we'll just do a draw operation here so we can actually see what's going on. And we're going to draw the window and the tiles. So update tiles is going to, as I said, update this tiles dictionary so it only contains the ones that are actually still there and it's going to draw all of the tiles on the screen as they move so we can actually see that movement operation occurring so i think that's okay last thing we'll do here is we're just going to call something known as end tiles now notice that this is happening outside of the while loop so as soon as we're no longer updating any tiles we're going to call this function so we're going to say define end tiles like this this is going to take in the tiles and what this is going to do here is just check whether or not the game is over uh, and kind of do that last cleanup operation. So what do we want to do here? Actually, let's call this end move because that makes a bit more sense. Okay. And then inside of here, we're going to say if the len of tiles is equal to 16, then we're going to return lost. So if after we did a move, we have 16 tiles, uh, that means that we can't move anymore because the entire board is well, full of tiles uh, and that way we lost. So we'll just say we lost and then we can handle that later on if we want. And then what we also want to do is we want to add a new tile to the screen, right? So every time we make a move, a new tile gets added. So we're going to say row column is equal to get random position. And this is going to be tiles. And then we're just going to say tiles at the F string of row column is equal to tile and then what we need to do is randomly select whether or not we want the tile to be a two or a four so we're going to say random dot choice and then in an array two four just randomly pick between two and four and then the position is going to be at row column and we'll just return continue so we know that we can continue the game now from here we'll also return and move and then what we'll do is we'll just go to main here and we'll actually start calling these functions that we wrote and then if we get a like end game returned then we'll simply end the game right we can send a message to the user we can do whatever we want in fact i'll actually let you guys handle that but we'll talk about that in a sec okay so we've now handled moving left the other movements will be fairly straightforward i know that was kind of complicated let's actually test this though so what we want to do is we want to check for the different key presses right so if you're pressing left right etc so we need to first check, okay, did we press a key? So to do that, we're going to say if event.type is equal to pygame.keyDown. So did we press a key down? If we did, we're going to say if event.key 
is equal to pi game dot k underscore and we'll start with left. So if we press the left key, then we're going to say move tiles and we're going to pass window tiles clock and the direction which is left. Okay, so we're checking. All right, did we press key down? If we did, let's check the key that we pressed. If it's equal to K left, which is the left arrow key, you can also do like K A if you wanted to do the A key. So K underscore A. But in our case, we want the left arrow key, which is denoted by this. Then we're going to call the move tiles function, pass the window, pass the tiles, pass the clock, pass the direction of left. Let's copy this four times and handle the other directions. Okay, so if the key is right, then we just change this to be right in lower cases. Otherwise, we'll do up and down and then adjust this. So that's up and that's down. Okay, so now we have all of the directions. However, only left is going to work right now. So let's go here and let's move left. And you'll notice that they merge together and then we saw a new four got added to the screen. Now, when I press left, you'll see that even though there's no movements happening, a new thing will add onto the screen. And you can see that as we move them, they will move and they will merge accordingly. OK, so we can only currently move left and you'll see that now at this point, the game's over because we can no longer move or merge any more tiles, although I guess we could go up or down or whatever. But in this case, that's fine. OK, so that's it for left. Now we just need to handle the movement in the other directions and then we're done. So to move in the other directions, we pretty much just need to copy all of this and then adjust it for the different directions. So let's go with right now. So we're going to copy all that and paste this inside of here. So to move right is going to be very similar. We're going to keep the column key the same. We're going to change this to be true because now we want to sort in reverse order. The delta now is going to be positive. So moving in the right direction and the boundary check is going to be if the columns is equal to column minus one, because that is going to be uh, the kind of right boundary, right? If we're equal to whatever the number of columns is minus one, well, then we're in the last column. Now getting the next tile, we're just going to add one, not subtract one. And now the merge check will look a little bit different. So here we're going to change the sign to be less than and we're going to subtract the move velocity because now we're moving right. And now for the move check again, we're going to need to adjust that as well. So this is going to be tile.x plus the rectangular width plus the move velocity is less than the next tile.x. Okay, so we kind of just flip this around again because we're moving right. That should now handle right. And then we're going to say ceiling is equal to false because we actually want to round down when we're moving to the right side. Okay, let's run this. And let's check left and right so we can now move to the right and we can merge as well as moving to the left. OK, looks pretty good. Obviously, we could you know make the movement more fluid, but I think this is actually pretty good so far. OK, let's see what happens if we go and merge and you see now that game is done. All right, so let us now do the up and the down. OK, so how do we do this? Well, for up, we're going to copy the exact same thing. And actually, we'll copy it from left because it's going to be a little bit more similar to that one and paste that here. Now, for the sort function, we're now moving up and down, which means rather than using the column, we're going to use the row. Now, for reverse, this is going to be false as well. And for the delta, we're going to change this now. So it's going to be zero and it's going to be negative move velocity because we're moving up in the y direction. For the boundary check, this now will be row not column. So if we're at the zero with row, that means we're at the top of the screen. And when we get the next tile, we're looking above. So it's going to be row minus one, and then the call will stay constant. For the merge check now, it's going to be similar, but this time we're moving up, right? So rather than using X, we're going to have to use Y. So we're going to say tile.y is greater than next tile.y, and then this will be plus the move velocity. For the move check, similarly, again, we need this to be Y. So we're just going to adjust this so that rather than uh, X, it's Y. And we're just going to change from rect width to rect height. OK, for ceiling, that's going to be true as well. And now we're going to copy this and we're going to do the same thing for down. OK, so down this time reverse is going to be true because we're moving downwards. The move velocity is going to be positive. The boundary is going to be rows minus one. When we look at the next tile, we're looking down a row, so we're going to add one. And for the merge check, again, slightly more adjustments here. So we're going to say tile.y, we're going to change the sign, and this is going to be less than the next tile.y, 
minus the move velocity. And for the move check, same thing. It's going to be next tile dot y. We're going to change the sign. And we're actually going to take this and we're going to put this on the other side. Okay, so we're going to go like that plus the rect height plus the move velocity less than the next tile dot y. And the ceiling is going to be false. Okay. Now, if we run this, we should have a finished game. So let's go ahead and do this. And you can see that we can move up, we can move down, we can move to the right, and we can merge our tiles. And we can play the famous game of 2048. I don't know if I quite know the strategy, maybe as well as some of you guys. But there you go, functioning game. Now, as I kind of play through this, I will mention that there are a few like kind of tiny little bugs or things that you could adjust here. For example, it doesn't handle when the game is finished. There's actually something I intentionally wanted to leave for you as homework. We already kind of set it up, so it should be fairly straightforward to add it. And there's a few other like kind of small movement things that you might notice if you play this a long time. But overall, I think it's pretty good and it's not really worth it to fix them right now because it will add a significant amount of time to the video. And I think most of you are going to be pretty happy with this implementation that we currently have. Now, another thing to note is that if you get too high up, you're going to run out of colors. So if we look at this here, I only added uh, my quick math is what, like 10 colors, nine colors. So that means we're only going to be able to go up to two to the exponent nine, or actually, I think two to the exponent, yeah, two to the exponent nine. So you're going to need to add some more colors if you want to handle larger values than whatever two to the exponent nine is. I don't actually remember what that value is. So uh, you can add more colors, you'll see that you'll get an index error if you go above that value, but that's a pretty easy thing to fix. Okay, reminder, all of the code will be available from the link in the description. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, make sure to leave a like, subscribe to the channel, and I will see you in the next one.